So I have a, a couple of stories, and um, one of them um, actually um, goes back a few years. Um, a few years ago, you might have heard about um, this star, Tabby Star, or now it's called um, Boyajian um, Star, which is named after the astronomer who um, sort of uncovered its weirdness. And a few years ago, there were all sorts of headlines where... Um, People were wondering whether um, they were discovering alien civilizations. Um, they were calling it the most mysterious star in the galaxy. The weird star gets weirder. And, um, and uh, astronomers and other speculators were coming up with all sorts of different ideas about what could be causing the weird, um, very strange observations they were seeing about the star. And the story behind the star is that um, it was um, discovered um, by the Kepler spacecraft. And what Kepler does is it finds planets orbiting around other stars by looking at um, what we call transits. Uh, basically, when a planet um, passes in front of the star that it orbits, um, there's a small dip in the light. Um, so every time it orbits, uh, there, um, there's a small drop in the amount of light. And because um, stars are so much bigger than the planets that orbit them, typically um, the amount of brightness that you see um, dip is less than 1%. And so on the ground, um, from telescopes on the ground, this is a very difficult observation to make because the, our atmosphere um, muddles up um, the, the light that's coming in. Um, you know, that's the reason why we see um, stars twinkle in the sky. And so ideally, what you want to do is you want to go up into space to make these observations. And that's what the Kepler spacecraft does. And what Kepler um, did was to basically stare at one part of the sky uh, for years, um, multiple years, and um, it focused on about 100,000 stars that it monitored. And so out of these, um, we have um, right now clo um, several thousand um, stars um, that um, Kepler, Kepler has discovered that are um, candidates for having planets. Um, they have to be confirmed from the ground. So I believe there's under 3,000 confirmed um, planets um, from Kepler. And here are just some examples of actual light curves. And by light curve, I mean um, when you measure the starlight over time, uh, this is what um, how you see the starlight um, dip. So up here, we have um, a star that's very constant, and then you have a dip, and then uh, sometime later you have another dip. So that shows evidence for one planet. And the, um, the light curve at the bottom shows a different um, star where you actually have two different dips. You have a really deep dip followed by a shallower dip, and that um, tells you that um, you're actually seeing multiple planets. So those two different dips are caused by two separate planets. One um, planet is physically larger, and so it blocks out more starlight, whereas the other one is smaller. It doesn't block as much starlight. And then you can also see that instead of that um, the, the starlight being nice and steady, this star actually varies um, in brightness. And there's a lot of scatter. There's a lot of noise. Um, here, and so um, the um, Boyajian um, star was first reported by um, Tabitha Boyajian, who is a professor at Yale University, in 2016. And instead of those nice regular light curves that we're um, we're seeing in the um, in the slides before, this is what the light curve for Boyajian's um, star looks like. So you can see that the dips are very, very regular. Um, some of them drop by a little bit. Some of them drop by quite a, a bit. And there doesn't seem to be any repetition to the dips um, like you would see for, um, for other star, stars or planets detected by Kepler. And uh, if you look at it over um, many um, multiple years, so uh, the, um, the x-axis um, is the number of year, um, days. So 365 is somewhere around here. So we're looking at multiple years worth of observations. You can see that the dips come um, somewhat irregularly, and the dips can be um, both really big and deep uh, as well as shallow. And then you can also see it kind of goes crazy um, towards the end here. And as people um, started investigating the star more after the publication of that paper, um, and then here's um, just more of those dips, um, you can see that um, the dips are also not necessarily symmetric. Uh, so they can be very asymmetric, where the left half doesn't match the right half. Um, but um, 
So as people um, started more and more people started investigating this, um, other um, astronomers went and looked um, back at his historical data, and they found that the star has actually been dimming um, for the last hundred years. Uh, um, and so um, these um, lines here, or these dots, represent um, <laughs> the historical record of measurements of that star. And then, um, just as a comparison, um, this author also looked at um, sort of comparison stars just to make sure that um, you know there w wasn't something funny going on with the um, the photographic plates that he was going back and looking at. Um, and so the comparison stars looked pretty steady, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, Boyajian's star definitely has um, this dimming going on. And this dimming um, also um, has occurred at um, somewhat um, longer time scales or, or shorter time scales more recently, where you have um, over the course of about um, just under three years, you have um, a decrease of about 0.3% per year, but then um, suddenly there's this um, drop where the dimming um, occurs about 10 times as fast, so about 2.5% per year. And of course, um, there are lots of um, theories and ideas about what could be causing um, the starlight to change um, brightness so drastically. One idea is that um, you know perhaps this is a um, relatively young star with a lot of um, circumstellar debris, gas, and dust that um, eventually form planets. But in this case, perhaps um, this is too young of a star to have completely um, cleaned up all that um, debris around it. But um, um, there's um, really no other observational evidence that when we have um, a debris cloud, and even if it, for stuff that's orbiting, it seems like the, those dips are just too random um, and too aperiodic um, to be explained by um, something like this. People have also considered that you know perhaps there are um, planets that are colliding with each other and they're creating these giant um, gas and dust clouds. Um, perhaps there are swarms of comets that are in orbit, um, and they have these very elliptical orbits. And so um, as they're orbiting around the star, the um, debris trails that they release um, can also obscure um, the star um, in, the, in this very aperiodic way. And, um, and then, of course, um, there are a lot of memes that uh, have come out. And um, so there were people who thought that you know, perhaps it was aliens. Um, and one of the um, prominent ideas is um, that um, possibly this was uh, a Dyson sphere. Um, and basically, an advanced civilization has constructed a shell of solar collectors to try and collect all the energy emanating from the star. Um, but um, astronomers take um, this idea the least seriously. <laughs> And so um, we come up on um, a paper that um, came out um, actually a couple years ago in 2017. And this is something that I actually talked about in a 60 Minutes in Space uh, back then. And uh, these um, authors uh, basically talked about um, how um, they proposed an idea where um, there were planets that were involved um, to cause the dimming. But what happened was the planets or other objects um, fell into the star. And so what uh, happened was that the star actually brightened as a result of these objects falling in. And so the dimming that we're seeing over time is actually due to the fact that the, um, the star has been decreasing its brightness from that brightening due to this, um, uh, these objects falling in. And so they show um, in their paper that um, you could get um, dimming on the order of the amount that you observe over time. But there are also some problems with this um, paper, with this idea, because it turns out that for um, this um, type of thing to occur and for Kepler to have seen it, out, um, so um, Boyajian star is unique amongst the 100,000 stars that Kepler observed, but it turns out that you would have to have lots and lots of planets um, in these orbits that could um, have them fall in. And so it um, seemed like it was unlikely for this scenario to actually take place. So um, it turns out that then the, um, some of the authors from this paper um, just came out this month with a new paper. So Brian Metzger and Nicholas Stone uh, were two of the authors in the previous paper. We have a new author, uh, Miguel Martinez. Um, all of them um, basically... Um, work um, at least part-time at Columbia University. And um, their idea has to do with 
um, what we call exomoons, meaning uh, moons around uh, planets um, around um, this distant star. And so uh, basically, for um, their scenario to work, you basically have to suppose that in addition to um, the star at the center, you also have a more distant star that's in orbit around that central star. And so that's um, what this is. This is the orbit of that more distant star. And then this is, um, represents the orbit of the planet. And there is somewhat contradictory evidence whether um, this um, second star actually exists. Um, people have observed another star, and depending on what evidence um, you look at, um, there seems to be either evidence for or against the idea that um, this star has a companion. But uh, this companion, if it does exist, or if it you know, is actually in orbit around Boyajian star, is orbiting about 900 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so 900 astronomical units. So it's you know, it's not really orbiting close in, but it's a significant um, object that does have um, a gravitational perturbational effect on the um, planets in orbit around the main star. And what can happen is that when you have the star in orbit and it's getting closer and further away, the gravitational tugging from that star can, um, through um, simulations, um, actually disrupt the orbits of planets that um, are in orbit around the main star. And so the idea is that over time, um, over hundreds of thousands and perhaps even millions of years, um, you can actually cause the orbit of the star uh, of the planet um, to go from circular to more eccentric or more elliptical. And you can um, not only cause it to go more elliptical, but you can also cause the end, the closer end of the orbit, to get um, closer and closer to the parent star, to the point where um, you, you can imagine um, the, um, the, the planet getting swallowed by the star. And then in the next image, we're going to zoom in to um, the planet. And so this blue object is a planet. And then the, um, so this is the extra exoplanet, extrasolar planet. And this is the orbit of the moon, the exomoon around that planet. And so here we see that the orbit has gotten more elliptical. It's been stretched out. And as the uh, interactions continue, there is actually a good chance that what can happen is that through these gravitational interactions, the moon itself can actually get disrupted and have its orbit um, basically fly away from the planet. And so you have um, a planet that's in orbit around um, the star, and then you have the moon that's in orbit around the star. So basically by having this more distant um, companion star, you can disrupt not only the planet's orbit, but moons that are in orbit around that planet. And then so finally, so um, basically, um, you can eventually have um, the planet um, get swallowed up by the star, and then um, you have um, what you have left is um, a moon or even multiple moons. And so what the authors um, did was to run computer simulations, and here um, what we're seeing is along the um, what we're seeing is the track of a planet as it encounters a star uh, multiple times. And along the side, the up and down, um, we're seeing how close that planet gets to that star. So um, initially, it's about 19 times the, uh, the star's radius uh, um, distance away. That's the closest that it gets, but as you see, um, as it um, interacts with the that distant um, stellar companion and it orbits, it gets um, closer and closer um, as its orbit gets disrupted until, and along the bottom here is, um, is a time scale um, telling you um, the amount of time in um, 10 million year um, chunks. So over the course of about um, 20 million years, it's gotten from 20 to one times um, the radius of the star, meaning the planet is actually swallowed up, swallowed up by the star. And the lines, the red lines, represent the, uh, the four large moons of Jupiter. And um, what they basically tell you is that if you were to insert Jupiter into the system, uh, this would tell you when the, um, the moons of Jupiter would get tidally knocked out um, from the planet's orbit. So that means initially, um, even um, Callisto, which is the furthest um, large moon of Jupiter, um, it would get um, gravitationally disrupted from Jupiter's um, gravitational um, 
field, so it wouldn't orbit Jupiter anymore. And as the planet got closer and closer, the gravitational um, disruptions would um, eventually um, interfere with Ganymede and then Europa and then finally Isle. So basically all of Jupiter's main uh, large moons, which are about the size of our moon or larger, they would get disrupted and instead of orbiting the planet Jupiter, they would orbit the star itself. And then Jupiter, uh, after about 20 million years, would fall into the star. And um, here is um, another um, simulation showing how um, the, um, the, <coughs> the planet can actually um, get um, closer and then further away. So that's what that um, line is showing. And, um, and then after a much longer time, uh, about 100 million years, um, it finally um, falls straight in. And then finally, here are some other tracks um, showing how, again, um, these different scenarios of um, planets um, falling in after um, several hundred million years. So um, from their simulations, they find that um, about half the moons get um, completely ejected out of the solar system completely uh, from based on um, these simulations. And about 40% uh, of these moons um, actually collide um, with the parent star. So um, on the order about 90% of these objects are completely lost. But um, just under 10%, um, so about 8% um, of the moons in the simulation end up in orbit around their parent star. So they neither get ejected from the solar system nor are they swallowed up by the star. And what happens then is that the, uh, these moons continue to in orbit around um, the star. And if the moons um, orbit closer than what they call the ice line, so that's what this outer um, circle is. This is um, the line in which it's so cold that um, basically all the volatiles, um, the water, methane, and ammonia, get locked up in ice inside um, the moon's crust. But once they're inside that line, the heat from the star can basically start boiling off those ices. And so you can imagine, because the moon is orbiting um, closer than that ice line, it stops becoming a moon, it, but it turns more into like a comet-like object, where the ices are boiling off, and as a result, lots of debris are also escaping um, the crust of this moon as it's being disrupted. And so the authors of this paper um, Imagine, and they, um, in their discussion, they show that it is um, possible um, for the material boiling off these moons to uh, mimic a lot of the effects that we see from um, that are observed from Boyajin's um, star. And whether this model is correct or not, um, I think um, will depend on whether there really is uh, that second star out there that's causing that disruption. And right now, some of that, as I said earlier, some of that evidence is contradictory. But what's also really interesting is that earlier this summer, there was another paper by Ed Schmidt at the University of Nebraska. And what he did was to, um, he went and tried to find um, analogs or um, similar stars um, that, are, um, that have similar light curves as Boyajian star. Now, um, Boyajian star is, um, appears to be the first of its kind, but what um, Schmidt did was to go back and look at a catalog of um, data that was taken by a um, set of robotic telescopes, and um, this is actually the first of um, a series of robotic telescopes. Um, so this one ran um, from about 1999 to 2000, and and it was located in New Mexico. And what he was able to find was that out of about 14 million stars that were observed that had enough data, um, he found about 21 um, stars that had um, this light curve behavior that was similar to Boyajian star. So 15 of them he ca categorized as slow dippers, meaning they didn't um, change their uh, brightness uh, very quickly, and Boy Boyajian star would actually fall it into uh, this group of 15. But he also found that um, there were six that were what he called fast dippers, uh, meaning they um, changed their brightness really quickly. Um, but um, after examining the properties of these stars, um, he thinks that um, the slow and fast dippers don't, are probably the same type of star, um, but um, just um, observationally, um, but um, some of them are more extreme um, as far as the amount of dipping, um, the amount of light that they um, um, lose um, more so than others. 
So, um, you know, the, the mystery behind Boyajian Star is not, still not completely um, solved yet. Um, we have some um, really promising theories, but it's just going to take more observations to um, nail down whether um, some of these um, theories. And, you know, um, the, the result that we saw um, in this paper isn't um, the only um, theory out there, but there are competi um, other competitors out there coming up with their own ideas. And it will just take more observations for us to know whether um, this or one of the other ideas is correct.